Um, sounds like the microphone's on. Everyone can hear me? Brilliant. So uh, I thought the last two presentations were great. Sorry, I missed your one, Tony. I'm sure yours is great as well. Um, I want to, um, wanted to try and talk about the stuff that fills in the gaps, because um, there's a bunch of other great presentations happening today. The network is kind of the bit that should just sit silently underneath all this stuff and just work, just deliver what you need, right? But I wanted to just cover what are the important things about that network when you're choosing the network, when you're choosing how to distribute PTP, when you're choosing the topology, when you're choosing orchestration. What is it about that network you need to think about to, to make sure that that does become a transparent piece of your infrastructure that just delivers um, what you need it to deliver? So, I'm going to cover a little bit more about PTP. I thought Daniel's presentation was amazing, and uh, hopefully mine kind of roughly fits in with that. Uh, I hope to answer some of the questions that were asked. Uh, I'm going to talk about architectures. Um, I want to talk about visibility and programmability, because I think that's kind of monitoring of these systems is often an afterthought, and I don't think that's the right way to do it. And then I'm going to cover just a few more specifics about choosing a switch. So robust PTP architectures or <coughs> distribution. So we've heard how important PTP is for 2110. It's essentially the thing that enables you to rebuild your stereo image. Pretty much everything else you can avoid, but the stereo or the 5.1 or the surround sound, that is the really key thing you need your PTP for. It makes sure your left and right sampled audio arrives back at the right place next to the right ears at the right time. So I don't want to go over very much of what Daniel had to say. What I'm going to cover is uh, where, why do we need this special network for it? What, what is that all about? Um, you saw this drawing before. I won't do that either. So the, the reason that you need something special between your GMs and your slaves is you've got this blobby networky thing in the middle whose job is to deliver packets normally in the right order and fairly quickly. You've got networks on which you've got a stack of traffic with big empty, well, 1,500 byte packets, one gig, two gig, three gigs, 11 gigs worth of stuff, down big old connectors. So the PTP packets are pretty small. They're 6,400 odd bytes long. They're going to get nudged out of the way by these big 1,500 byte packets all the time. And the heavier you use this network for your media, the more nudging gets done. That nudging is what happens in the um, natural buffering and forwarding of the switch. That's what gives you jitter. You might see it as uh, described as PDV, uh, packet delivery variance. And that jitter uncertainty is what means the end device has a more difficult job to do when it tries to recreate the right clock, right time, an accurate GM locked slave. The thing, the thing that the thing that you need to try and do in your network is have a network that avoids that jitter. Now, we heard from Daniel that you can, you can create uh, networks with less jitter or more, cap more, more, program more constrained jitter. You can provide uh, quality of service metrics. You can prioritize flows. That means the PTP gets delivered in preference to other packets. But remember, the packets you're getting delivered in preference to are 1,500 bytes long. So if you started one of those, you're going to have to wait for the rest of that before you can deliver anything. So as these networks get bigger, you want to have accuracy across a wider scale. You need to do something other than just deliver PTP using the normal unicast and multicast methods that sit in the forwarding plane of the switch. Those two are the boundary clocks and the transparent clocks. I'm not going to cover those in enormous detail because they've been done already. The thing to remember is, and they, they do behave identically in theory, and identically on well-designed transparent and boundary clocks, all they do is remove the uncertainty of the delivery of those packets through the switch. They do it in the two ways that Daniel described. Boundary clock essentially is a, a PLL inside each of those switches, which locks to a master, like a PLL in a genlock circuit in a device, in a, in a broadcast studio. And it then has this global clock it delivers out of every other port. Phase locked, frequency locked, essentially a transparent link from master to slave or master to next slave port. So it reduces the jitter to theoretically zero, but obviously some implementation losses. Transparent clock does the same thing. It does it by understanding the delay through the switch. 
And so it takes that delay out, or allows the endpoint to take that delay out with the correction messages. Same result, but they're implemented subtly differently. But those subtle differences are things worth knowing about because they'll help you to choose boundary or transparent in your infrastructure. So the, the boundary clocks are really quite smart. They provide also they provide a DAing function, if you like. So typical, I'm going to choose our switch, right? Because I know how it works. We can support 400 endpoints off a single switch. So you can think of that boundary clock as a DA for PTP with good accuracy that will deliver 400 slaves. Now, those slaves could be other boundary clocks or they could be end devices. But you can see immediately an easy way to build a scalable network out of things with boundary clocks that have that sort of scale. They also have an amazing ability that you can, um, you can have different profiles on each port. I'm going to cover that in subsequent slides. Transparent clocks, they push the load back onto the master because they just are forwarding multicast and unicast PTP messages normally. They're just timestamping them. So they scale pretty much infinitely because there's no software involved. It's all hardware in the switch. So you can have as many slaves hung off a transparent clock as you feel like, but you have to have a master. The next boundary clock or master up has to be able to cope with that. So two, uh, two neat pieces of technology that allow you to, to scale and increase accuracy in your PTP network. I missed the slide. Let's hope not. Um, how are you going to distribute PTP? There was a question earlier, so I'm going to attempt to answer that as I go through this. This is, um, this is a, a, an example of a robust, <coughs> resilient, reliable PTP distribution to, uh, in this case, uh, an air-gapped red and blue network. So you have a red network, a blue network. The, the only connectivity really is, is PTP space, and we can, we can, we can uh, provide massive amounts of, of uh, isolation in the PTP space. So nothing will get between them except PTP. In this case, I've injected two PTP GMs. You can have more if you'd like more resilience. Into a couple of distribution switches, they can be running boundary or transparent, your choice. Uh, I've seen both. Boundary is nice because it's simple. Transparent is nice because you've got a, a native monitoring port where you can see the BMCA happening. You'll see all the masters. You'll see which one is decided to get on and be a master natively out of any old transparent port clock on this switch. If you choose to use the boundary clock mode, it's absolutely fine. You just don't have quite as much um, intrinsic native PTP monitoring capability. And then you can see multiple links to, in this case, each spine. So this is a very simple architecture. PTP just flows straight down. The same PTP will flow straight down. You'll end up with the same PTP on both ports of all your devices. Doesn't matter what you break, you've got multiple levels of resilience redundancy in here. You can, you can break a switch, you can break a link, you can throw a GM away, you can lose something down here. There's, there's a lot of paths between GM and endpoint. So very resilient, very simple because of the flow down. The only, um, the only you know, minor downside, which was alluded to earlier on, is these are probably, these are spine devices. They're probably 100 gig spines. You're burning a 100 gig port or part of a 100 gig port to connect into a 1 gig um, GM. Or you're burning ports to, to connect into your distribution layer. So depending on scale, you're burning some one gig ports or some 100 gig ports to connect into the distribution layer. But do you know what? We've heard how important this stuff is. A couple of ports on a big network, it's not much really. You know, that's a multi-viewer, right? You've got plenty of spare ports. So I like this architecture, simple. This one is more complex, provides the same level of resilience and redundancy. It's just a little bit less intuitive to understand exactly how it all works in the case of a failure. It has the benefit that you're, you're, you're uh, dumping your PTP from your distribution switches into the leaf layer. Now, there's nothing, nothing wrong with either of these methods. It's a uh, horses for courses, choose what you think feels best. This has the same level of resilience. You've still got multiple piles everywhere. You can still have at least two levels of failure everywhere, and the whole thing still works. 
I think the, the, the most important thing maybe to think about PGP is that you've got to be incredibly resilient. If, in theory, if you lost both of these, the first, you know, the first uh, boundary clock in the system would go into holdover mode and we'd carry on serving PTP into your network. Nothing, nothing's going to go wrong at this point. Your building is going to drift slowly away from real time because we have a, you know, we no, no longer have a, a, a GPS locked system. But it, everything continues to drift nicely. Everything continues to work. It's all going to be okay. Stops being okay when somehow you have to fix this and suddenly there's a step change in the time you're serving back to the network. So key message here, make sure you never get to the point where you've lost a GM linked to the network. You can lose the GPSs because these guys tend to have slow, slow kind of lock back in. So as long as that happens, you're okay. Um, but the, these boundary clocks, they're going to hard kick back to where they need to be. So you know, if you feel you need more than two GMs, put more than two GMs in. Have as many as you like. But just make sure you don't get to the point where you don't have either of those connected. Here we go. This is the one I thought I'd lost. So, what else can you do with these boundary clocks and transparent clocks? They add more value. They are pretty cool, actually. The boundary clocks, essentially, or especially, I'd say the boundary clocks are probably my preference, unless you've got a good reason to use a transparent clock, like the, the absolute scale you need and the inability to drive a, um, uh, to you, you know, if you can't get, if you can't build a system where the switch has to serve less than 400 endpoints, then transparent is the way to go. Boundary is my preference. Um, you don't have a lot of security with PTP, and so you have to build that into the network. We have to build as much into the network as you, as you can. You've already heard that typically endpoints, certainly in the AS67 world, if they can't see a master, they'll jolly well become one because somebody needs to be a master, right? Um, it makes it really easy in the audio world. Your point-to-point your -point links have always got a master because one of them will pipe up and be that master. That's a disaster in this world. You've got thousands of these audio devices. They're all going to pop up and become masters. One of them is going to be a rogue. I've seen it at many, many interrupts. It's kind of like a classic, why does my PTP not work? Oh, there's an audio device, wants to be a master. So one of the things you can do with boundary clocks is you can, for example, put a, put a boundary clock port into a mode where it's only going to be a master. Cannot ever be a slave. So now you can see here that the PTP is going to flow down through the switches. This guy is only ever going to be a master. It's going to be slave to one of these two. This guy is going to slave to this guy. These guys are only ever going to be masters. They can never be taken over by a rogue slave device. Okay? So you've immediately prevented this kind of backwash of bad PTP into your infrastructure. You get this, get this ability with a good boundary clock. Um, you can do other stuff. Um, in the boundary clock mode, the CPU takes a role in what's going on. It's, it's got a software stack doing stuff that it needs to do. Um, and so you can use the power of control plane ACLs to limit what is allowed to get to the control plane, which is where the PTP agent runs. So for example, if you wanted to lock your network to only three GMs that you happen to know the MAC addresses of, and of course you'd know that because you planned it, then you can do that. Use an ACL to make sure that nothing except those guys can get through. You could probably do it with, uh, with data plane ACLs, but it's, it's much, much more tricky, I think, because you've got an awful lot of devices that are all talking PTP and all wanting to chat to the same multicast groups. So boundary clocks, for me, unless you've got a good reason, would be my go-to technology in the network. Transparent clocks are available for scale above 400, for example. I'll jump back to this one. If you built a system like this, you would never get to 400. You could use boundary clock everywhere here. These guys are 32 or 64 times 100, or they're 48 times 10 or 25, so no problem there. These guys are, uh, they may well be more than 400 ports, but each of these are multiple links. So actually, the number of active boundary clocks per physical aggregated link across the whole switch is very, very likely to be less than 400. So whether that's, you know, how, however you've aggregated those, the chance of this guy having to serve 400 individual boundary clocks is very low. For example, here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, okay? So 400, easy. Um, 
The other thing you get with boundary clocks, which makes system design a little bit easier, or potentially a bit easier, scalability potentially a bit easier, is individual profiles per port. So you heard about that earlier on. So there's, uh, there's the AS, AS67 profiles, there's the 2059 profiles, there's the ASR16 profile, which is kind of like the Venn diagram overlap of those two. What are you going to use? Well, do you know what? Why don't you just use whatever you want to use? Um, use whatever you want to use at your slave port, because some audio devices can't cope with 2059 signaling rates. That's why AS67 was invented. Um, some endpoints would like 2059 because they, you know, they want the accuracy that 2059 brings. What you can do with boundary clocks is not get stuck with a single profile for your entire network. So you could, for example, serve 2059 plus plus. What do I mean by that? More, more yeah, up the upper end of 2059. 16 sinks a second rather than eight, for example. Whatever you felt like. The, the, the higher these messaging rates, the more accurate each of these layers of boundary clock will be. So you could distribute a high rate to 2059. You could then distribute or define individual ports as being lower rate, AS67 type rate, so you don't over um, require too much processing in the, in the relatively small CPUs of audio devices. Um, and then you can deliver 2059 to your video devices. So you can, you can build a network which otherwise would have required you to have multiple GMs running multiple profiles, running multiple uh, PTP domains. You can do that as a virtual PTP network. And you can change that whenever you like. And that's, that's on, a, it's on a per port basis. Other considerations, uh, do you know what? Uh, Daniel set it up for me. Monitoring. You want to monitor your network. You want to monitor your PTP. You want to make sure it's running properly. So there's a ton of data in these switches. You can expose that data at the CLI, which I've done here, or through other telemetry mechanisms, SNMP or streaming telemetry. Um, just as an example, here's kind of like very basic. Show PTP. So it tells us what mode we're in, gives us the identity of the GM, gives us our identity that the slaves will see or other connected devices will see. And it's telling us... We've got one slave and one master. Obviously, not a very big network. Um, over here, brilliant debug tool. How do, how do I make sure I'm actually getting messages from things? Well, we're looking here at uh, port channel 102. We can see that we're a slave. And suddenly, you can start seeing all of the messaging that's going on. Announce messages sent, one. Well, at some point, we felt like we ought to be a master. Then somebody told us to stop doing that. So messages received. Sync messages sent, a couple, before we decided not to do that. Then we started sending a bunch. You can see the message counts here. So typically, this is brilliant for working out why an endpoint isn't working. It's getting the sync messages because we're passing them on, but it's not, we're not seeing a delay request, for example. So obviously, that's not going to work, right? So this, is a, this sort of nuts and bolts debugging data is invaluable to get the system up and running. Most of the time, it works fine. But when it isn't working fine, it's not a very transparent protocol. You need something to help you out. Um, this sort of stuff can be automated. You can pull this data out of the switch and use some sort of automated mechanism to analyze the system, make sure the system is happy, is locked to what it's supposed to be locked to, is serving what it's supposed to be serving. And then here's another couple. Uh, these are brilliant. This is a, a quite a recent thing, show PTP monitor. Um, these are the last, um, the responses. These, these, this is the, the maths calculated from the last responses that the, P, the, the boundary clock agent saw. So, when it got the last delay request, what did it decide the network delay was? What, when it got the last um, sync message, how did it calculate what its offset from the master was? So with this data, you can see how well is this boundary clock locked. It's not very well locked. But it's not very well locked because it's locked to a Raspberry Pi in my garage. So unsurprising, right? But it is locked to a software Raspberry Pi in my garage. And what is the delay? That's massive. Well, that's because it's going through a very cheap net gear and then a, a Wi-Fi network extender into my garage. So, you know, it's, it's kind of surprising it's working at all. But look, that data there is the stuff that you would need to monitor, as Daniel pointed out, all of the points in your network. So are your Dash 7 networks looking the same? Is one layer of them looking a bit suspect? Is one of them looking a bit unhappy? All this data is available, and it makes life a bit easier. It's available as kind of you know, standard logging, so you can see here the changes in grandmasters. This, this is all syslogged. All of this data is available. This stuff is all out there.
for automation systems or processes to help make sure that PTP is operating as you need it to operate, to try and make the network layer transparent by not having to worry about it all the time yourselves. So, I'm sure there'll be some questions, but I'm gonna talk about architecture because I'm guessing I'm running out of time. Um, very briefly, let's talk about architectures. I'd say 90% uh, of, of the installations I've been involved with so far have been big, a pair of big switches. So that's um, RTL BCE, a um, couple of big holes in London. Um, there's a bunch of them, a uh, TPC truck. Uh, they're, a, they're a very simple network. So where they got Dash 7, they got two of them. Where they haven't bothered with Dash 7, like Timeline and NEP trucks in the UK, they've just got one big monolithic switch. So very simple. IGMP works just fine. Don't need any orchestration because there's, these are non-blocking, line rate forwarding, not gonna drop packets because they feel like it. They're just gonna operate and give you line rate multicast forwarding at, at the bandwidths you're looking for. Okay, and, and these have, I don't know, how long have the RTL BCE systems been in there for? Like four years. I mean, they, they, just, they just do the job, right? Um, and if you're looking at scale, you know, the only limitation I'd say on these guys is that you can only buy them that big. Other brands are available. So, um, but they, they, have a, they have a physical limitation. The number of line cars you can get in them is limited. But when you look at what that limit is, it's still 16,000 square at three gig. It's still 2,025 gig endpoints. So this sort of scale is gonna be absolutely fine for a lot of people. It's just big and monolithic, centralized, doesn't actually look like a network because it's just two big switches. Nothing wrong with it though. Maybe it's a start point, maybe you add leaves later. Nothing wrong with starting with an IGMP system and adding SDN later. These things are all completely possible. Why would I want a multiple switch topology? Well, you might want a multiple switch topology because you want to decentralize your kit. You want top of rack or end of rack. You might already have a fiber plant installed. You might have um, physical buildings that are separated that you want to um, run as individual locations. You might want a smaller physical failure domains. There's loads and loads of reasons. One of the things that comes with multiple switch topology is, in my mind, it becomes a blocking network, typically. It becomes blocking because in this case here, for example, if I connected this guy to this guy, and then this guy to this guy, and I added up all the bandwidth here, and I give you the same bandwidth here, this guy isn't actually doing anything. This guy is just being a connector. Okay, if I've got 600 gigs here and 600 gigs here, well, why don't I just connect that 600 gigs to this switch? There's no expansion, there's no leverage of the spine happening here. So, nothing wrong with it. Imagine you've got a second one of these, red and blue. But this isn't, as in a one-to-one -one one -one, um, kind of uplink to host topology, it's not gonna give you very much. So naturally, you're gonna say, I've got 1.2 terabits here and I've got 600 gig here. You're gonna start to build a blocking system naturally by the very fact of the economics of not wanting to just stick a bunch of spare switches and spare optics in, in the way. So that kind of drives you to needing some sort of tie line management to manage these guys. Because if you asked via IGMP at this multi-viewer for all these cameras, and that was 1.2 terabits, and this was only 600 gigs, well, guess what? You've just broken it. And IGMP can't fix that. It's not bandwidth aware, it's not source size aware, it's just does its best effort to deliver stuff to you. Okay, so as soon as you get multiple links, or IP tie lines, I think of these as, you need some sort of orchestration, unless you're massively over-provisioning your network in the first place. Um, and then, I'd say 90% are IGMP-based right now. 60 or 70% people are starting to talk about wanting some sort of SDN, some sort of multi-switch topology. Uh, everyone is listening to all the rhetoric about cloud, and they're seeing what the cloud guys are doing. Leaf and spine, that's what the cloud guys are doing. Can I have that for my multicast network, please? Yes, of course you can. So we can build a leaf and spine. You have to be a little bit careful because you're still probably gonna build a non-one-to-one -one provisioned network because it still doesn't, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. You just wanna, you wanna start thinking about 
uh, workflows and what does need to connect to what. We can build your one-to-one -one provision network if you want, but it, it's still quite expensive. You can build a much cheaper, very flexible, scalable architecture if you have a view on what your workflows are. So the other really good reason for this sort of architecture, because it does look very much like a data center, leaf and spine, is you can start to think about some sort of virtual network functionality. So layering other services on the top of your 2110. So maybe, maybe a little bit out. Think about this for the future. But if you have this architecture, you can think about it for the future. You can build an SDN orchestrated network that is just 2110 AES 67. But you can think about once you're comfortable that all works properly and your SDN is orchestrating and protecting those vulnerable 2110 citizens, why not use the spare network capacity that you're bound to have to do something else. And that could be transcoding jobs or Avid editing or whatever you feel like. Once you've protected the 2110 and you have spare bandwidth, it's available for other stuff. Do other stuff with it. Run other protocols over the top of this network. Run VXLAN if you need layer two adjacency. Anything else you feel like running, you could do that in a well-protected 2110 type network. Um, so very specifically, I wanted to talk about a um, couple of network architectures I've seen. So this is, uh, I call this kind of like a hybrid, purple hybrid approach. Um, this is uh, CBC Canada. This looks very much like CBC Canada. Um, they've got a red and a blue, almost air-gapped, except they've got this weird purple one in the middle. Um, what's that all about? Well, it turns out that lots and lots of devices have got Dash 7. They've got a red and a blue. Brilliant. There's some that don't, microphones, speakers, embryonics, endpoints, dot, dot, dot. There's just a few bits and bobs. If you plugged them into a red or a blue, you couldn't access them in both parts of the network. And so you've lost the resilience or you've lost um, the ability to have a, uh, a microphone here and a speaker over here that's connected directly. Couldn't do that anymore. Okay? So you'd have to choose to have all of your endpoints that are single homed in one network. Wow, now I can't do maintenance on that network, right? That doesn't sound good. So this architecture gives you these kind of purple leaves. You still have an air-gapped spine. You still have physical diversity defined for your reds and your blues because they're not connected together. They can't do that. You have to be a little bit careful about making sure nothing that you don't want can, can transit across here. But again, that's nothing special. We can all do that. So. Um, it has some of, the, some of the same attributes as a, as a leaf and spine. You've got you know, layer three topology. You've probably got BGP or your favorite dynamic routing protocol running. Um, you can use the same PTP architectures that I talked about earlier on. Nothing changes there. Um, you can add as many of these purple switches as you like. Um, it, it needs an SDN controller because you've got this leaf and spine. But it doesn't need, the, the job of the SDN controller can focus on protecting the flows and adding the value in individual air gap networks, okay? The other one I've seen is this one, which is a complete purple network. So this, this does look like a data center. Um, doesn't matter where you connect any of the, the, the reds and blues, and you've still got the benefit of the single-ended device support. What you've, and you know, all the other stuff, layer three, BGP or OSPF or whatever you feel like, but PTP, it's all the same. The really the big difference is you're now having to create uh, dash seven diversity in a logical fashion, not in a physical fashion. And that means what you need is a more complex SDN controller that can understand how to make sure that happens effectively, accurately, reliably all the time. Okay, so it's just a more complex SDN job. But a pair of those are perfectly good architectures. Very, very quick uh, reminder on who needs SDN. Um, you need SDN, you need to really be thinking about SDN as soon as you move to a multi-switch topology or to a switch topology where you have multiple links aggregated together to give you bandwidth between multiple switches. IGMP can't do that for you, doesn't do that for you. It'll just give you a you know, load balance via LACP or via PIM. That's not load balancing, it's statistical load sharing. Um, so in the worst case scenario, you've got 200 gigs and everything ends up on 100 gig. So SDN fixes that for you. 
SDN also makes sure that you don't try and drag 1.2 terabits across a 600 gig link, because it knows you can't do that. So on top of that, it adds, uh, it'll add maintenance modes, it'll add orchestration, it'll add protection to allow other services to run over the top, it'll add policing maybe, it'll add all sorts of other smart stuff. So once you go to something that's more than one switch, you're attempting to get your money's worth out of that switch and its infrastructure, you really want to think about SDN. So, how am I doing? 15 minutes, right? Um, visibility and programmability. These are, I think, under-reported under requirements in a network for this sort of architecture or this sort of application. Um, typically, we, as broadcasters, we've had uh, complicated monitoring systems, nicely bubbled up to a big green button or a big red button. You dive into it and you work out what the problem is. But, you know, you look at most of the test gear, it's about is the colorimetry right? Is the aspect ratio right? Is it the right program? It's, it's kind of application layer stuff. What we need is not to forget that you need some network layer stuff to make sure that your network is behaving, delivering, not degrading, still doing what you designed it to do. Just doing what the guys that built it, the system integrators and the vendors, built, tested, you signed for, and then they walked away, and you've added more services to. That's what you need. So. The, the thing that underlies that, really, is good telemetry, good data from the switch available to you quickly, seamlessly, richly, in real time, ideally. Um, you need APIs to get to that. And you need the flexibility to add stuff that doesn't already naturally exist in the switch, for example. Um, so there's, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of OpenConfig. OpenConfig is a, a customer-driven, vendor neutral monitoring and uh, configuration, <coughs> Yang based model protocol set. Um, what does it do? It, it means that there's a single common API, if you like, that you could use to every switch out there that's implemented open config. So it means you could build some uh, telemetry systems or some monitoring systems or some network management systems. You, you could build it once and target a, a flexible set of vendor agnostic switches. So you could, you could choose different switches in your infrastructure if that's what you felt like doing. You could have a, you know, RTLBC, you've got a, a Juniper on one side and an Arista on the other side. They've had to go to the, the, the least common denominator to monitor anything because, because they've got two switches. If the least common denominator was open config, you could have a single tool that could do pretty much everything, assuming both vendors supported open config. Um, and then we have a lot of customers who um, have massive DevOps type guys, server DevOps guys, um, and they're, they're all using other tool sets. So we can also integrate another, I guess it makes it cheaper. You're using a, a bigger, a more available um, skill set. The server config guys, the guys that manage the servers, there's more of those than the guys that manage the networks. So if you can use the tools that those guys use, to manage your networks, you can reuse that tool set, reuse, reuse the skill set at least. Um, I think there's, you know, why do I want it? I want to make sure my network is working. But actually, once you've got all this sort of capability, you can build flexibility. You can start reconfiguring your network. You can start understanding how it's performing. And you can start to drive business agility by having the capacity to change your infrastructure, whether that's understanding uh, you, know, you might even use this to bill multiple tenants. You might use it to decide when to add another leaf pair. You might decide to do all sorts of stuff. I talked about streaming telemetry in a little bit more detail. Um, we're all used to SNMP. It's kind of, it sort of works. You poll everything every couple of minutes, make sure you don't get too much data. But you do poll the same thing every couple of minutes. Is the power supply good? Yes, it's still good. Is it still good? Yes, it's still good. Actually, is the power supply still good? Yes, it's still good. So you don't really need that, right? What you want to know is, when is the power supply not good? So wouldn't it be better if the device told you when the power supply was not good? Then you could stop worrying about it. So if you had a connected session, resilient, reliable, secure, quick, real time, turns out you can get a lot of benefits. You don't have to burn server time processing the same SNMP messages over and over and over. The devices you're monitoring don't, doesn't have to send it over and over and over. You just send what's changed when it's changed. You get quicker messages, and you get more accurate messages, more robust. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of 
I mean, OpenConfig supports this. Um, not as richly as our own telemetry at the moment, but that, that will come, okay? So uh, another good reason for OpenConfig in my mind is you kind of get the same sort of end scenario. Um, the, really, the key thing is you turn the data that's in the switch into information, something you can act on. So here's an example. This is a, this is a kind of multicast monitor, we call it. It's, it's, a, uh, it's like a proof of concept, if you like. It's can we turn the data in the switch about snooping tables and multicast tables into something usable for a broadcast guy? Yep, sure can. That multicast group there, 239.111, who knows what that is? Nobody knows what that is, right? Not even your broadcast engineers know what that is. Turns out, if you allocate it a friendly name, Studio One UHD Camera One, nobody needs to know what that is because they can all talk about the thing that's actually at the application level. So now they can worry about a problem with the Camera One rather than having to go and look up the table to find 239.111. And because we can look at the, the snooping tables and the MRAP tables, we can look across an entire multi-switch network and tell you where did that come in where was it replicated? Where did it go out? Where did it hit hosts? Where did it see another switch? Where was it replicated? So um, you, get, you can have an end-to-end -end view. Now, all I'm trying to say is that there's a ton of data in the switch, and if you pull it out and turn it into information, you can give that information to a broadcast engineer in terms they understand, not in terms that the network guy has to understand. Another example, Larvo's uh, uh, smart dash stuff. Um, this is an, just another example of where somebody's taken the data from a switch and they turn it into something useful. So there's their topology view. On that has got the, the amount of traffic on each of the links. It's not difficult to get it out of the switch. You could do it with a CLI. The, the, the value is in turning it into broadcast information that allows you to worry about your bro broadcast processes. So, you know, really, honestly, my message is just that there's a ton of data in the switches, and it's, it's your switch, it's your data. Um, I encourage you to get your broadcast vendors to do something with that data, because it will add a ton of value to your processes. Um, so, choosing some architect, this is kind of like finishing off, make sure I don't get in the way of your lunch, try and get a laugh in somewhere. Um, choosing an architecture and some media switches, okay? You know, 40, 35 minutes is, is not long enough to talk about this in any great depth. I'm just trying to skim a bit of the surface. So some of the things that you might want to be thinking about when you're choosing your architectures or your switches is, what is it you're trying to build? You're trying to build a high-performance network. Now, there's no way of kind of disguising this. There's nothing in what you need that is not in lots of other switches. The cloud guys, the HFT guys, the service providers, They've all got the same sorts of requirements that you have got. The problem is they tend to have a third of the requirements, another third, and another third. So actually you're asking for all of those in the same switch, okay? That's the challenge. The challenge is finding the reliability, the high throughput rates, the multicast support, the PTP, the monitoring. You're trying to find all of that in a single switch. That's your challenge. You also want it to be COTS. You want it to be very reliable. Um, you want it to be flexible, blah, 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 you know, there's, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Those are your sort of very top level requirements, right? I'm just putting it to you that think about what COTS means. It does mean it's available off the shelf, but it doesn't mean it's available off every shelf. So just be careful which device you take off the shelf. Make sure it fulfills the needs you actually have. Why would you choose a specific architecture? I get this all the time. It's a really good question. So typically, it's down to how big do you think you want to start, and how big do you think you want to be in five years' time? So how big do you want to be in five years' time tells you whether you need to be able to expand, build something that's scalable, or whether you can fit in a big switch pair. How big do you want to start tells you whether you want to start with the big switches, or a leaf pair, or some spline type architecture where you have a pair of smaller spines and hang stuff off it. Those, I think if you've got a start and end point with some vagaries about that, then you're in a really good place to work out 
whether you want a pair of switches or a multi-switch network. Um, do you have any fiber plant that's already there? You know, that's a brilliant question. I mean, people often go in and have a chat about what you're going to build with no thought to the fact they've already got a, a ton of fiber connecting stuff together. So they've already got physical locations they have to put switches at. They can't move those because they're not going to rip up that fiber or rip up the building. If they're building a new building, brilliant. Greenfield site, amazing. Just, you know, define what you want. But there's a lot of cases where you're going to be restricted by what you can build. What's your appetite for IGMP versus SDN? I mean, I think there's some good SDN controllers out there now. Um, how many are in live production? Not many. But they're being built by people we trust, so I have no doubt that they'll be good. But you may, you, you have a different risk profile. It depends on how, you know, whether you trust those guys to deliver or whether you want to go with something that's a bit easier. Nothing to stop you, as I said earlier, from starting with an IGMP-based system, either massively over-provision it or build a couple of big switches in, and then moving to SDN later on when you're comfortable, when you've done your own proof of concepts. Depends on your time scales, obviously. Um, I think I've probably covered most of that stuff. Um, 2110-21 is brilliant. Tells you exactly how bursty traffic is allowed to be in the wide and narrow profiles. I bet you there's going to be a ton of really cool bits of kit out there that doesn't adhere to 2110-21. It's going to be because it's amazingly innovative, does something nobody else can do. Some bloke invented it in the garage. It adds tons of value. Our, our industry is full of that stuff, right? So whilst you can talk about your 2110 narrow senders and how that doesn't really impose much of a load on the network, Bear in mind that if you want to benefit from some of that innovation, non-compliant non, uh, senders in a bursty sense, you're going to have to think about how you're going to deal with that burstiness. That burstiness can only possibly be fixed or dealt with, accommodated, in the first switch it hits, which has got enough buffers to deal with that burstiness. Okay? So just, just think about that. If you've, got a, if you've got to ram your switch full as well, then obviously the buffers are working harder. So think, think about the trade-off between ramming your switch full, bursty senders because they're innovative, and whether or not you need shallow buffers or deep buffer switches. So, <laughs> it's my first laugh. I'll get cross if you don't laugh. Um, isn't it easy? Don't you just choose the cheapest switch for the right number of ports? Brilliant. So, um, I'm going to tell you why it isn't that easy. I mean, the, the answer is in the, in the slide, right? We don't make all these different switches because customers just choose a cheap one that's got the right number of ports. They're all built for something different. They're all built for, um, you know, some are racing cars and some are SUVs. Some have lots of features. Some have just got tons of really fast ports. So you, you have to, some have big buffers, some don't have big buffers. So some support PTP, some don't support PTP. So you have to kind of think about what it is you're trying to get out of your infrastructure. You have to think about your objectives. Um, there you go. That's why you wouldn't just choose a cheaper switch, right? Because you need the right tool for the right job. So typically our switches are, are designed to have a specific kind of use case. They tend to have a little bit of a bias towards L2 or L3 or complexity like um, VXLAN and EVPN. Um, it's the same. It's the same for you guys. You need to be choosing switches that actually fulfill the needs you've got. So this is, this is it before you all go off and have lunch. Um, be careful about COTS. It, it, what it means to me is that it's not bespoke. It's not a broadcast-specific thing. But it doesn't mean that everybody has got one. Make your, I mean, it doesn't mean that every one of our switches is the right one either. You, you need to talk to your vendor, talk to us, talk to your systems integrator, talk to your broadcast vendor, see who's had what experiences, talk to other customers, work out what the experiences are. Um, it's nice if they're built on merchant silicon because that's moving really, really quickly. You can see we've been beating Moore's law for the last five or six years. This is what's bringing 400 gig and 800 gig. It's what brings the uh, differentiation between the racing cars and the SUVs because we can just choose best to breed silicon and stick it on the box. So we don't have to worry about depreciating the value of our ASIC design because we haven't got any. We don't have to worry about the cost of our ASIC design because we haven't got any. 
we can worry about the software. And the software is really where the value is. It's in the monitoring, it's in the resilience, it's in the quality, it's in the um, flexibility, all those sorts of things. So um, hopefully that's, uh, that's just a summary of things you might want to think about when you're choosing a network. That's me. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.